If I read a book, a page about a particular concept, I'll read that and go, I understand the concept. And then put close the book. And this doesn't even have to be a long time, a day. Like this would be like minutes later, go and apply it. And I'm like, I don't know what to do now. Right? So the uh, felt sense of I've got this is in my personal experience, often not accurate. Very often and not I, accurate. Welcome everybody. Today I'm going to be uh, chatting with a good friend of mine, Jeremy. Uh, he's one of the more interesting people I know and a fellow teacher. Um, he's partly responsible for me even creating this channel to begin with. Me and him would often have very intense dialogues uh, where both of our enthusiasm and volumes would overtake the room, uh, which led to uh, other people who had to occupy the same space suggesting that we start a podcast and you know put these conversations out in public so this is me making an attempt to do that um and i hope you all um get as much out of it as i'm told that the other people that couldn't continue to focus on their work did at the time uh welcome jeremy um thank you for making time today thanks for having me should be fun nice nice so let's get like straight into it um the first sort of area that i'd love for us to start to build a discussion around is an idea that you've sort of presented to me around hyperfluency within easy material or maybe foundational material or versus parcel fluency in esoteric material. Even as, as I like sort of think of this topic, you know, and you brought me, what are you sort of defining as esoteric material in the world of tech? Well, I think there's a whole sliding continuum, right? So it's, it's, it's not so much like this material is esoteric and this is simple material. It's like wherever you're at, for where you're at right now, to you right now, there's some material that's like, you know, sort of um, maybe your bias right now is that like everybody's supposed to know that because you know it and that, you know, the, the person you work with knows it. So probably everybody's supposed to know what you're thinking. There's some other material that you're like, oh, that's what the badasses know. Right. And you're like, oh, maybe I'm supposed to go learn that. Right. So maybe it's like just, going off and being like, I'm going to learn assembly because like, that, so like, like a whole continuum. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah. you're starting off and you're like, uh, everybody knows HTML, but that like, you know, everybody knows a little bit of CSS, but that like, uh, those CSS transformations, those are esoteric. Yeah. So I like, or maybe you're mind, like a lot farther along and you're like, everybody knows how to use react, but like doing that, uh, I don't know what the hell. Right. Yeah. It you depends where I feel like the usual suspects are people who talk about like Haskell or Lisp. They're like, you know, all the real sure, thing. Sure. And then for some people, maybe C, but like, you know, if you're, if you're a front end developer, just moving to the back end may seem esoteric. Exactly. Or vice versa. And, and although I mostly mean with respect to difficulty, not so much like sh sideways shifts as yep. like, as like uh, everybody knows that's more sort of shifts. And a, a circumstance that comes up for me a ton is in prepping people for doing algorithms interviews, which as you know, is uh, an area of interest and specialty of mine and something that people come to me for advice on a lot. And, um, and a lot of people are like, they feel like they got to add more like cool bullets to their list. You know, like, oh yeah, I know about finger, I know about splay trees, you know, oh, I can do a red black tree tra uh, transfer, you know, I can do the red black tree rotations from memory on a whiteboard or whatever. And, and that is what I'm going to give it example is for most people I talk to who are like already working pretty hard on that algorithms interview thing. Those are maybe they're like, they're difficult topics that they're like, I bet if I knew that, then if that came up in an interview, the interviewer would think I was really a badass. Yeah. And I'm like, that's all maybe a good idea, but maybe what you want to do is like, take it back four or five steps to the stuff that you already like know how to do. Yep. And make sure you know how to do it. Yeah. So I get to it. So for, for me, and this is, let me see if I can give you an example. So for me, my hyperfluency is I, really, really, really invested in getting to know Ruby and Rails. So like read most books on the Ruby language, read most books on Rails, did most of the popular tutorials at the time, uh, built all the common apps. You can, maybe I built a shopping cart. Maybe I built like, you know, the to-do app, all these different things that you could do. I spent a ton of times knowing that I could work with Rails inside and out. I understand the internals of the framework, so on and so forth. Uh, on the flip side, the more uh, wanting to pump my own tires, feel really smart, feel really accomplished, I'll be like, everyone should learn C. Or I'll, oh, you know, dude, I'll say, dude, I'll dude, say dude, things like that. Keep it inside Rails. Yeah. So, don't even consider that. 
just inside rail skills. Yeah. Think about the skills that you're like, everybody should know how to do them versus the skills that you're like, lots of rails developers don't know that. And if you're a rails developer who does know that, that makes you cool. So like, you know, I'm not that good at this rail shit, so I can't necessarily say, but like, yep. maybe there's some like, um, you know, some libraries that everybody knows are kind of difficult and useful. Yep. Yeah. Like or I, I, maybe, I, maybe something that's more common between us, like if we talk about JavaScript, it'd be no, no, like- No, 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 no. I want to keep it on the Rails example. Okay, I, yeah, want to, yeah. I want to like finish this Rails example. Yep. Because here's what to me is the, is the easy material hyperfluency. I talk to students who, when it's time to make a new route, they have to stop and think how to do that. Yep. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade. Yeah. I'm just saying at your skill level, whether or not you've got how to use this library and this library, you know, maybe there's some like, um, like, uh, uh, OAuth integration library that a lot of people like so, and, right, it, so and it like intimidated you or something. I'll give, right? I'll give you some new type. One of the things I've used heavily in recent times for a particular project was adding my own types to active record. Okay, perfect, right? So like so imagine like some student- and, and, and serializing in and out of the database and all that stuff. Beautiful, perfect. So imagine some student or, or some, uh, you know, person with, with nine months of experience say. Yeah. Right? Is like considering whether or not they should study that. You know, they should like, hey, oh man, Aaron knows how to do that. Should I know how to do that? Maybe I should figure out how to do that. And on one hand, dude, if you, if you studied that, you figured all that out, think about how much stronger it would make you. So that's kind of super awesome, right? Yep. On the other hand, what if that person also, when it's time to just make another bread and butter, you know, need another controller, need another set of, you know, templates, need another, uh, you know, route set up in the routing table. And it, instead of just being like done, they have to sit down and think for an hour. Yeah, or they're like still going to get it done. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah, not saying they can't do probably it. Probably the good example where that happens for most people, like routing, maybe some for very new, but like active records, that rabbit hole. Like yeah. active record, if understood, can do a lot with very little code. If it's not understood, you can do a very little with around. a lot of code. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's the like, that's that example of, you know, where that gets. And it's like, it's to, to say something like, oh, you should really wrap your head around active record. That's, a statement that sounds true, but uh, how do you like approaching that is maybe not as clear a path as would sound from making us because it's, it's in there. What you read the docs, you memorize all the functions. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's like with any language, you know, like just because you memorized all say all of the keywords and oh, syntax besides, of an object oriented language, you can't write OOP code. Exactly. And besides, nobody does memorize all the functions. Yeah, exactly. Like not, not literally nobody, but like all the, mo all the badasses, badasses, you know, sure. They've got a few more of them memorized than you do, but they don't have them all memorized. That's not what it is about. Right? No, then that would be ridiculous. So, There's only yeah, a exactly. handful of languages where their surface area is so small that you would make an attempt at that. Exactly. Or, or some individual developer who that's just what they're good at. So they did it anyway for the hell of it. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, fine. But like not normal high skilled developers. That's not how normal high skilled developers work. Okay, so, so I think we've kind of established a bit of a what we're talking about as a spectrum here. So when we're talking about hyper fluency of ease material versus fluency, that implies, you know, like, do you lean one way or the other? Is this a ping pong effect? How do you know to like, it's like you said, it's a spectrum, right? Where do you start on that spectrum? When do you know it's time to slide that spectrum? the other side? Yeah, yeah. Exactly, and, and, exactly. and when's it time to slide back? Like, you know what I mean? And, and, and for a lot of the people, like, again, this is mostly come to my attention in the context of this algorithm study thing, you know, for interviewing. Yeah. Um, but I think it applies in a lot of places. But in that context, a lot of the most keen students I talk to, you know, the, the people who are obviously on the uh, talented or experienced end of the curve, you know, they're still early, early in their career, but they've had some fundamentals somewhere. Uh, so maybe they're a little ahead of some other students. A lot of those people are really focused on that, like reaching for the, the glamour topics. Mm. Right. Yeah. And that's all cool and shit. But I feel like for a lot of those people, it's just like, buddy, if you just wind it back to what you think is straightforward, but what maybe some of the peers that you're competing against think is esoteric, but what you think is straightforward and you just get that. So you can do it asleep. You can do it, you know, while getting attacked by wild dogs, you can do it, you know, yeah, you know what I mean? They need more to use a popular phrase. They need more carters, not more like repertoire. It's like oh, do more oh, punch what? a kata. It's like you know they talk about coding kata, K A T. Oh yeah, right? kata. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kata. yeah exactly. Right. Exactly. They need more katas. They need yeah. more katas. That's exactly what I'm saying. I and 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 the original idea of kata is not this like horseshit version I see lately that just means like do this exercise and move on. But the original idea where you do the exercise, 
and then you wait till you've almost forgotten it and then you do it again and you compare your second time results to your first time results say did i learn something and then the next time you try it you deliberately try to do it differently you're doing the same exercise but you try a different approach this original idea of kata is where you're actually repeating it to try to figure out what did i do wrong uh yeah exactly i feel like a lot of people so so with respect to this this scale i feel like most of the time it comes up i want to push people to say you know less esoteric more katas more you know more like getting the stuff you know all the way into your bones yeah so like i like i guess what i would say is i like there's certain subjects that i tell students that i want this should seem like obvious and second nature exactly so That's like second nature exactly and and so like to give examples of ones that like i bump into a lot like most of my teaching these days is more centered around javascript than it is around ruby but um like areas where I'm like, obvious ones is like the obvious one you might think is like, say like callbacks and async problems. Like, yeah, that's it. That's one. Like having second nature understanding of async when you're working with JavaScript really helps. But where so I find profitable. that like that even falls apart, like is a lot of what I encounter now is people don't have that second nature understanding of arrays and objects and even why two kinds of collections exist. The amount of, uh, and just to give an example, and this isn't like, you know, I don't want to make this seem like this is a negative thing because people are at where they're at and it's a completely appropriate to be there. But the amount of people yep. that want to work with an object and immediately reach for a loop. And I'm like- As soon as you said object versus arrays, that is exactly what I thought of. Yeah, and, and, and that For is... V in object dot values of the object. And it's like, okay, th that's, that is almost never a line of code. That should be written so one of one of my favorite explanations <laughs> that um a student actually came back to me when they were making a strong effort to give themselves an analogy of the differences and they go this is how i'm understanding it does this make sense and i'm like i love that I'm, I'm gonna steal it but it was imagine you're in an office building and you're in the office and you're staring down a hall of offices and on one side of the offices all the doors have numbers say zero to ten right and on the other side of the the hallway all the offices have names printed on the door right and that was where the student ended and i said and add for the names part that there's a little sign at the front that shows their names and where it is exactly right exactly. i go yeah. add that and then you've really nailed it and, exactly. I, and i try to use that and i go if i said uh you know imagine there's someone on the left hand side called uh mike i said if you find mike well you're going to check every door and go is mike in here is mike in here is mike in here and then i said on the left uh let's go find um you know, Deanne or something like that, yep. you're going to yep. look at the sign, see there's Deanne, she's like the third office and go straight there. Go straight third office. Right? And office and, number two, number one doesn't have to listen to your dumb ass saying, is Deanne in here, please? No, yeah. you already know where she is, dude. Yeah, exactly, right? And, and But I think, that, and that's helpful. And like, as I say this now, that probably helps students understand the, uh, cert, like the ability to find something within a collection of data. But that does, that's not the whole discussion there. You know, I don't want to get too off track, talk about the merits of, you know, arrays versus objects, but just, just give me that. That's, that's probably a prime example of like- For sure. Where- um, Hyper core fluency, when you get it out of the way, you're no longer spending any brain energy on it, right? Yeah. Got to get that. Yeah, and, and that's a really big part of why I think it matters is because, um, you know, our conscious minds are a lot weaker than we think they are, a lot weaker than we hope they are, right? So there's a lot of this, like, if you, you just can't think about too many thoughts at the top of your mind at the same time. So you got to get this idea so practiced, you know. Um, I think one of the traps, Aaron, I don't know if you experienced this yourself, and, I, and I've developed some, personally developed some discipline around it, and I try to advocate for it, but it's a very subtle thing, is that it's very, we, we trick ourselves in the sense that when we, if I read a book, a page about a particular concept, I'll read that and go, I understand the concept and then put, close the book. And this doesn't even have to be a long time, a day. Like this would be like minutes later, go and apply it. And I'm like, I don't know what to do now. Right. So the uh, felt sense of I've got this is in my personal experience, often not accurate. Very often and not I, accurate. And, I, and, I, and that's something I try to highlight to students. And I think this exists outside of the world. Like this is more like a human nature learning thing, but I think this is a huge part of the problem is that if, if, you were, if I was to give them a vi an, one more video on objects and uh, arrays, they would watch the video and I'm very confident at the end, they would 
in all honesty, describe their experience as, yes, I get that, that makes sense. And they wouldn't be lying to me. And then normally in those situations where if I was to be walking someone through an exercise and explain, go, yeah, I get it. I go, okay, I'll write some code out and I'll be like, fill in the blank. And they're like, uh, and I'm like, and I don't use that to say, I use that to illustrate, see how your mind just you. lied to you. Yeah, I don't feel like uh, Veritasi needs any more uh, uh, YouTube juice from us. Yep. But uh, this actually is a, is uh, his initial, um, like the initial purpose of his channel, right? I, you know, he's evolved and grown in ways good and bad over the years, but um, there's a very strong emphasis there in his channel originally on how like he's doing all this, like going out and interviewing people about science topics to make sure that people acknowledge their own gaps by like yes. saying like, you know, asking a question that like feels like probably not have a simple answer. And people are like, oh, I can work at the answer to that. It's like, turns out actually, no. Uh, anyway, we don't need to, you know, I, yeah, I think this whole thing about um, the sensation of epiphany mm. is almost entirely unconnected to actual learning. Yes. So. Learning you know. is more like, you've been on the exercise bikes going hard for nine minutes and you've committed to doing 10 and that last minute doesn't seem like it's going to be a lot of fun, but you want to meet your commitment. That's I mean, what, that, I'm not saying that's all learning. Like there's a, actually that's a lie because you know what? Um, I can give a counter example to that, that because I have some, some of those uh, hyper fluency, certain things covered. If I was to go back and use what I would argue to be a weaker learning strategy for initial learning on something like, um, to give a very simple example, if I wanted to go really deep dive back into CSS or something like that again, I don't need to do the like, this is the painful learning. A refresher can actually get me, and it, like that's enough to, to yeah, kickstart the engine. I don't think there's a rule that it has to be sweat. I think it's sweat more often than not, yeah, it, it's, sweat is played down. What's that? Sweat is played down. It's not, well, well, people don't check. People don't ve verify their learnings. I think it's not even about sweat, maybe not sweat or sweat. Yeah. It's like people don't have the habit of like, how right, do right, I right. verify that I've learned? Exactly, exactly, right? So just pretend you hadn't said that for a second, just to kind of, you know. Yeah. I think what a lot of people, and I think you sort of went down this path for a second and noticed it was wrong and came back, but I'm just going to rearticulate it. Yep. Is... um a lot of people think that maybe the implication or the consequence of what I said about the epiphany being an illusion is, you know, you got to put a lot of work and pain in, or, you know, you know, to do a lot of reps or something. Right. And some, t that's true more than people expect maybe, but it's not always true. So I'm not saying it's got to be practice. Sometimes you read the page and you actually do get it, but often not. And that you can't count on that sensation of, oh, I got smarter to be informative. And that brings me back to what you just said, which I'm emphatically agreeing with, which is this, um, you know, if you think you learned it, figure out how to check if you learned it. Because you can't trust your feeling of, oh, I'm, oh, that was really informative. That feeling is often a lie. So you got to like figure out like. So then I think that leaves you in a bit of a dilemma because, um, that's not always a process that you can bootstrap without a foundation in certain subjects. So like there's a certain amount of competency you have in a field where you can even set up those experiments for yourself. So if you're very new to it, um, you just, you just don't have enough of the, what's the word I'm looking for the enough of maybe the territory or enough of a, resolution on what you're doing like if you think of like a picture like a like yeah. a high level thing to know that like i can look down and i know enough of where my spots are and and the fidelity of these spots um to even start that up in a particular field so there's like that's kind of like a you know depending on where you're at early mid late in a particular domain you have to implore employ different strategies to do that verification so early obviously teachers serve that role yeah i i that's a good point that i hadn't thought about i think you're right that uh, especially early on you're you're in a particularly rough spot for that kind of self-auditing and so obviously yes a teachers are one solution um and of course as somebody who likes getting paid to teach uh obviously it's in my interest to, to promote that suggestion uh, i think it's a great one but uh <laughs> but um this is making me think about another thing about like um you know, kind of the value of, of project-oriented learning, which I think is 
well, there's a certain type of teacher who thinks it's worth nothing. And I think they're wrong. And there's a certain type of teacher who thinks it's worth everything. And I think they're wrong. Yep. But uh, uh, generally, I feel like I'm hearing a lot of people promote project-oriented learning more than I think is correct. But to give the huh. devil its due for a little bit, right? Um, to get back and sort of observe, well, this might be an asset of project-oriented learning for someone who is suffering that problem you brought up and unable or unwilling to pay teachers or to yep. find mentors. I don't know that I think project-based learning is a great solution to this problem, but it's at least sort of a solution to this problem, I think. I think it's a bit of a TikTok because like maybe bring down the scope of projects. Say you just learned a concept just about a language, right? Let's like say some, say you're just like, oh, here's a map. Right? This is what map is, right? And then it's like, okay, go away and make your own map. So it's like one single function, right? And that sounds kind of small, but like, that's a great one. Like I know myself for illustrating, like, hey, you're working with callbacks. Here's this like idea of like general purpose functionality that can be augmented. Like there's, there's actually a lot of, uh, if you're very new, there's several concepts that you need to wrap your head around to reproduce a map function. Right. And it's like, you know, as a your experienced programmer, it seems very obvious what a map is for and, and, and to write one. It would be second nature. But I think, you know, projects might imply like, oh, you need to build a whole website or you need to build a whole mobile app. Right. Is project kind of sounds larger than it is. But I think that, you know, a project could be uh, as simple as very small, um, like just like a little Q and A app, like you know, input output, you know, type something, you know, something like that. It's like just like even if it was like a enter one number, enter second number, here's the sum. Like just going through that process when you're a beginner after reading some things, it, it's like a layered interleaved process. Like one of the things I've lent on, and I don't know how effective it is. I guess, um, and this maybe ties to something I want to talk about that oftentimes when. I just want to put this down as a bookmark and we'll come, I'll continue what I was saying. But I think oftentimes in many fields, people that have had certain successes talk about the things they made them success without actually being able to verify that. But that's a separate subject. A but, classic overwhelming problem, I'd argue. Yeah. yeah but like the, the thing I, I would say is my strategy I used to use, you know, was like if I want to learn something is I would say, say back to Rails, right? I might work through several like copy, like, monkey see monkey do rails tutorials just to see it and where the learning generally happens for me in the monkey see monkey do is typos and then typos produce error messages and then those error messages lead me to understand that like oh this error means this is broken this error means this is broken right and you know and those error messages get in complexity as like the wrong data type is passed through a series of function calls. Like it's anything from like this just doesn't exist, a simple one to like this was never meant to be nil because several modules classes adjacent to this have you've you've done something wrong right so there's some learning that comes out of monkey see monkey do but at a certain point that, that there's a diminishing reward but now i've gotten a bit of comfort around the syntax i've got a bit of comfort around the errors and now i can go okay so i've just followed a book where i build a shopping cart how about i sit down generate a new project and attempt to build this shopping cart from scratch yeah yeah exactly because I think I think a thing a lot of people think about monkey see monkey do that I just couldn't disagree with more is that getting to the end is useful. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's like it's like oh, I want to be swole, so I'm gonna go out and lift some weights. The re the the goal there is not to have the weights up on the high rack, dude. Your job is to put them back down and put them away when you're done. The the weights are supposed to end up in the same place when you finish as when you started your set. Don't leave them at the top. You know what I mean? Like you pick up the bar and you put it somewhere up there and you're like, hey, I win now. People should like me because the bar is up there. No, asshole. Pick the bar up, put it back down, put it away. Yeah. It was never about the destination, right? There are things in life that are about the destination. It's popular to say that it's never about the destination for anything. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when you're learning yeah. and you're talking about a project you're doing for learning, finishing the project like you have to aim to finish because if you're not aiming to finish, you're not learning the right thing. Yep. But when you get there and you're finished, the thing is thrown away. And that's true for a lot of student or not even student, like a lot of learning projects, a lot of study projects, but it's most, especially it's infinitely true for anything where you're following a tutorial. I so think that if that someone says to, like, yeah, I think if that someone says like, I did this, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, what's in your portfolio? Yep. And anything you did for tutorials in your portfolio, I don't know, man, like 
like tell whatever bullshit lies you want to to get a job. I'm not telling you you're not allowed to lie, but no to your, I mean, I don't think you should lie, but that's not what I'm saying right now. But know in your heart that you're lying. Yeah. Like could that you, you know, that doesn't belong in your portfolio. You, you did it for a tutorial. That, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have done it for the tutorial. Yes. That was okay. That was good. But the thing you got at the end is worth nothing. All that is possibly worth anything is the experience you had along the way. And the way you tell what that experience was to get back to what you just said before I started this little yeah. rant about is it's some variation on, okay, you did it, put it down, put it away, hide that code, try again from scratch yourself without the tutorial. And when you find out what your gaps are, then you go look and then you put it down, you put it away and you try again. You know what I mean? To, to, to find out which bits you got and which bits you didn't get. And once you've done it yourself again, all on your own, that goes in your portfolio. Yeah. And like, I think, you know, it's, it's something to recognize here is there, there is a level of um, personal honesty and um, sort of like, like humility that ends up having to arise to make that process possible. Because if you're, uh, if that process of sitting down to do it again, and then realizing like, say like, you know, immediately as soon as you generate the project, you're like, oh, like within the first minute, I've hit, I've found I'm a gap and lost. Right. Exactly. That that for, for some people that can be a real um, blow, and that and that can be a deciding factor in whether they think they need to pursue a particular skill or something like that. And and I think in more many more cases than that being the actual reality for people is that people pull the pin at those points or they start to. Uh, steer their comfort uh, steer their learning back to a more comfortable pace which i don't want to necessarily take away from that but you have to modulate that like you have to be very careful about how you adjust that comfort to um i am feel like this is affecting my self-esteem like there's, there's an honest thing that has to happen there and i think that you know back to the teachers is i Personally, I think that one of the skills of a good teacher is their ability to A, recognize the student's self-esteem around a particular subject and B, be able to um, help the student differentiate from uh, what is just them uh, needing some more time, an appropriate amount of time that's, you know, there's no, there's very hard to decide what is the right amount of time to learn something and the right amount of uh, struggle. And, and then, uh, uh, you know, creating that, that channel forward for them, you know, so they can see some forward momentum and, and start to know that, like, build up the idea that they can do it. I think that's really important. And I, you know, it's, I think, you know, it's very easy when you first begin teaching to think it's about how clearly do I explain things, right? Like you think, oh, I need to be able to A, understand a particular subject is obviously the first part. And then B is I need to be able to communicate the subject, which these are obviously foundational skills to a student, but the- High value skills, but yeah. But as I've gone forward, especially when people are newer in that particular subject matter, you have to have a certain amount of, um, I don't want to say empathy. Empathy is the wrong word. Um, a certain amount of uh, sensitivity, I think is more appropriate to, to, to like, uh, so that you can calibrate your uh, lesson to where they're, um, because you need to factor in the student's current openness because their openness is going to be dictated by their threat level. And, yeah. and different students manage this uh, in different ways. I was just talking to my wife yesterday about some marking I was doing and talking about how, you know, when a student gives a bad answer, you know, I was marking a quiz, student gives a bad answer and try to decide how rude to be to them. You know, do I, do I think what the student needs is a kick in the ass? Or do I think what the student needs is a little bit of safety? Like, well, you're wrong you know, good luck, do better next time versus like, what the shit, dude, you didn't even try here, wake up. And, and the reason it's even coming up, of course, is because like, you know, sort of the naive, the naive answer might be that one of those is always right. Somebody might naively say, you know, always be kind to the students. Somebody else might naively say like, students always need pressure. And I think that's just, I don't know, I, following on what you just said, what I've seen over the time that we've worked together, basically as teachers together, I'm more and more believing what you said that like, 
that thing about good grasp and good explanation, which is something I really enjoy working on. Like that's my, that's my favorite part, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, is trying to figure out how to make the bestest explanation. But uh, it just turns out that that's, you know, it's not a non, it's not irrelevant, but it's actually a relatively small part of the package. And a huge part of the pack package is morale management. And like, uh, like the student is going to do most of the work themselves. Yeah. And so whatever you can do to make them work harder, not just like literally, not just work harder in this naive way, like not just work harder in this, just like putting more hours away, although that can matter a lot, yeah. but, uh, but, but like, um, yeah, like to do the thing in their brain that causes the transformation to happen faster, how to like coax them and baby them and yeah. baby them, baby them sometimes by telling them that you care about them and you're proud of them, which is true. And, and, you know, by, by showing them compassion and, and forgiveness and, and, you know, and, and safety and other times by being like, come on, fucker, step up, yeah, step so up. I, I, <laughs> I think mean, you can whatever of... it is that gets their brain juice in the best that it can be so they can have the best life a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now, whatever, at least with respect to the area that we're teaching them in, you know, like, you know, yeah. I don't, I'm not gonna tell you how to raise your kids because I don't pretend to know the first damn thing about that. But, you know, with respect to this whole like, yeah, stuff that I'm trying to help them with. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, what I, I guess like, <sighs> A definition that I use for teaching would be the art slash practice of creating the context for an epiphany to occur. You can't actually make the epiphany occur, but you can indirectly influence it through context. Right. And if you look at it through the lens of context, well, the context was the delivery. It was your knowledge of the subject matter. It was the student's openness. And like to really hit that home is if a student's like coming up to some kind of exam or prep or they have to hand in an assignment, they're late on tomorrow, but today they're in a lecture and they need to learn a particular subject, their um, emotional receptivity versus their anxiety about the thing that they feel like is proving them to be a failure is going to directly, no matter how clear you may explain a particular yeah. subject that they have to yeah. deal with right now for this particular uh, problem in their face currently they are going to have a, a substantially reduced level of bandwidth um, because of how much is being taken up by this overarching bigger thing. And so then it talks about like, you know, I'm a really big believer that the system in which things happens has a huge impact and looking back, okay, how did the system even create this? It's like, so when the students like, well, when did we get to check in with them? You know, the effect of class sizes on a teacher student relationship and how well you know them and their temperament, like how, how are you on boarded to building these relationships? Uh, you know, because, you know, being that uh, education is a business model, they're trying to find this balancing between, between how do we fill the classrooms out at a market price versus, you know, unit economics yeah. um, and, you know, and, and, and the product, but I think a lot of the product, the value at the, the most high, at the highest level comes from this uh, ability to actually genuinely connect with the person that you need to uh, create a transmission. There needs to be a transmission. And at like in computer terms, it's very hard to transmit information when there's no connection. Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. You want to kind of like wrap it up that way more, you know, symbolically. Yeah. I mean, do you want to just like rant about the economics of it for a bit? Or is that like sort of not the right topic for this channel? No, uh, every this 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 is all all on the table. I think that's a, a very viable because I think that's a very tricky thing because it's you know on one side it's like well there has to be an acknowledgement of the economics because if they're not met then it's just a non-starter, right? Yeah. And that non-starter can go so it's like oh well, the school can't make money. Well now they're going to look at third parties. Now those third parties have an influence over. The, so it's like it's like it's not even like that fixes it. There's all these different variables. So I've absolutely I think this is something to discuss about how the uh, economics of class sizes, uh, cost of tuition, uh, channels for subsidization, all of these things affect the outcomes because, um, but, you know, given that we're largely talking about like, you know, a, a STEM field, that's just so that you have a skill to go out and, and earn an income, right? So there's this whole like production line of, productive members of society yep. you know what i mean yep. so yep. yep 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 and i think you know the other part of this where i think this more falls universally is that 
I think it's unwise in many areas of life to not believe that you are not directly responsible for your outcome. So even though you may have gone to a school to be educated and you've paid them to, to deliver information and to guide you down a particular path, and there's all these ways to make that extremely effective, if you're only depending on A, the school to get you across the line, B, your employer to skill you up, you're ultimately, in my opinion, rolling the dice. Absolutely, yes. Un unequivocally. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so yeah, so like at the risk of like pretending I'm even older and white, you know, uh, obviously I got a long way to go yet in terms of like, look at all this beautiful gray hair, but I've still got a long way to go yet in terms of wisdom and uh, understanding how to live my life myself. So maybe I shouldn't like run my mouth about shit like that. But um, yeah, a couple observations on that track you just laid down. Uh, one is that like tons of things in life have an enormous component of luck, but that doesn't mean that they're all luck. And it doesn't mean that you should just be like, Jesus, take the wheel. Right. Um, the, the poetic metaphor that stirs my romantic heart on the subject is, you know, a sailor on the open ocean has got, you know, a couple of lines, you know, ropes, if you're not a sailor, uh, a couple of ropes to pull on and a little piece of wood that's maybe, you know, <laughs> a foot and a half across and three feet long or whatever, a tiller in the bottom of the, you know, a tiller off the back of the boat. And which is stronger, that little piece of wood and those couple pieces of ropes or the waves, the tide, the wind? Like, duh, right? The waves, the tide, and the wind are almost everything. Yeah. And yet somehow sailors come home to port. Put the fucking tiller in the water. Wait, rudder in the water, till in your hand. You can tell I don't actually sail. Yeah. <laughs> the little bit of flappy wood that steers Put the, the boat. Put the flappy bit in the flappy place. Yeah. <laughs> in the splashy pit place. Yeah. Right. Put the piece of wood in the water. Yeah. Grab the lines. Be alert. Be aware. Have your head about you. Do your damnedest. You're not always going to get everything you want by a long shot. But the difference between, you know, even though there's more randomness than there is choice in life, the choices make it, you know, can really make the difference between mm. happy harbor and shipwreck, right? So keep trying, keep, keep paddling or tillering or lining or sailing or whatever. Uh, you know, there's all these things that are outside of your control. Be at peace with that. Because you just might as well be at peace with it because it's not going to matter whether you are or not. So you might, as well, you might as well be okay with it. But that doesn't mean give up. So that's the first thing that, um, that uh, you know, I, I really think is a big like life lesson that was uh, provoked by what you just said. I had a second big thing like that, but I can't remember it right off the top of my head. It know. happens. It happens. It happens. Yeah. So like, I, you know, we could we probably, probably, you know, I guess we've gone a very oh, like- I have it. Yeah, no, I got okay. Get it. Um, what the? F no, sorry, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, yeah, maybe like it's, it's it's good point. So maybe I'll bring something else up that's a little interesting because I think we kind of hit on that, but it's it's more of a f philosophical. I don't think we're the kind of people that dive into the numbers of all this stuff. So I don't know how much more we have to add to the economics of it, other than the, you know, the impact it has and you know the conclusions that maybe we just drew. But, um. What about, you know, this idea that as, you know, we talked about like early mid stage, but, you know, there's self-taught, there's boot camp, there's two years, four years, there's all these different things. And, you know, and I can, I bring up with you, you know, we've talked about this and you, is the idea of, you know, what constitutes, you know, years of experience, you know, is five years, five years experience, is it, five, is it the same year, five times, um, you know, and where that experience, like I said, is that does 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 someone who's self-taught but really challenges themselves is honest for five years? Like, there's all these different things. So maybe I want to talk about like what's this like path look like? Well, maybe that's the wrong way to frame it. So that's it's a desirable way to frame it, but I think if we frame it that way, we're basically screwed on giving, okay. on having useful. Here's why. Name two developers you know that you respect that have similar paths. Everybody I know that I think is a badass 
is different for everybody else that I know that is a badass. I mean, I'm sure there's got to be commonalities that I don't know how yeah, to extract. Yeah, like I love that. So let me but, give you some, maybe like give you some examples there of two badass developers that I think have wildly different paths, but are very uh, accomplished in their own right. So one of my favorite developers to sort of follow and watch their talks and, you know, admire their work from afar would be like Rich Hickey. Okay. Right. Really a big fan. You know, he created Closure. His background was he was he was in music. I think music production, if I'm not correct. And he had and, and he got into programming. I, and I, I may be butchering his story here, but the way I understand it is he got into programming. He had to learn C to make some like MIDI plugins. It was like it was centered around his wanting to progress his music on dev career. Yeah, non-dev career. And like through this creative thing, like, you know, and, and there's a talk he gives where he talks about um, how he come up with closure and he'd hit like an impasse or a problem that he saw that he wanted to iron out and he wouldn't write code. He wouldn't read white papers. He'd like shut the laptop, lie down on his couch and just like, I don't know, go into like meditation, visualize. He gives a talk about, it. I think it's called hammock driven development if anyone's kind of curious, but um, that rings a bell, and, actually. And then someone who I think would have a very different career, who I also really enjoyed the work of, would be um, I want to get this right. Fabian Sanglad would be another, and he wrote all those books about like the game engines and so. And then like we got like John Carmack. John Carmack's got a very unique path. I, like that's another like developer I fanboy over. And you know, John less- Carmack's going to be my number one developer fanboy. Yeah, so that guy has got like, you know, and there's like, I love how his career is somewhat documented in one of our probably shared, you know, I wouldn't say favorite book, but a book we both enjoy, The Masters of Doom. Everybody yep. out there, you know, who's listening yep. to this, highly recommend it. I don't, know if, I don't know if I told you this. I, I read Masters of Doom by mistake. I was trying to do some studying for a deadline I had, and I was looking for something <laughs> in the library. And I ob- obviously part of it was procrastination. And I just sat down on the floor of the library and read it cover to cover in the middle of this other thing I was supposed to be doing. Just sit in the middle of the new Westminster Public Library, I think. <laughs> just fucking butt on the carpet. Just like, I just love that that I book's could, in I the library. I couldn't put it down. I, I just couldn't put it down. I couldn't stop, you know? Like, anyway. It's a good story. It's a good story. Um, yeah, and it's like, and there's so much cool stuff that people don't realize, like, about, like, John Carmack, that, like, John Carmack is, like, you know, with his wealth, got into, like, you know, rocketry and through that connection, him and Elon Musk are buddies and Elon Musk invites him over to look at neural. There's all this cool stuff. He's like, Oh, and all this, like, uh, all this, like, um, like, man, I thought I knew a fair bit about John Carmack, but I like actually watched the, the episode of Rogan mm. where he has Carmack on. And if anybody can, if anybody hasn't seen that and sort of kind of likes Rogan top, top tier. Uh, it's one of those things that like, you know, Rogan's got good interviews and bad interviews, but uh, he's got the sense to just, he's like Carmex in the studio and Rogan speaks up like every 15 minutes to say like, so I hear you have some things to say about cars too. And <laughs> Carmex just like goes off for 20 minutes. Whoa, yeah, wow. the guy knows so much about so many things. Anyway, but putting yeah. all that aside, if you go actually talking about him as a developer, yeah, yeah like you just look at his, de- like his, his central you know, the, the skeleton of his development career. And it's just like, man, I, that, that would, nothing like that would ever be me. And that's not the same career as another, you know, my number two name I would name is Peter Norvig. Yeah, he was and on my list. I those feel... guys couldn't be more different on some level, right? In terms of like the shape of how they get to where they are. Yeah, and they're all in their own way. I don't know if the word like, is, is, is luminary the right word of our industry? Sure. They're all, yeah. they're just like, they're in a particular category or tier in their own way. And they've got different strengths and they're not in the same category, but they're in the same tier maybe is the right way of looking at it. But even if you just reel it back in and you think about people you and I've both worked with who you thought that guy's got something that if I had, if I could add that guy's skill to my own skill, wow, that'd be really something else, you know, like oh, I'd be really a time. hero. So you think about people like that. I mean, even just, you know, I think of your strengths and my strengths as being pretty different and our backgrounds being pretty different. If I could add your strengths to mine, that'd be a huge level up. And maybe you would say the same, but also if you just think about, uh, you know, I'm thinking of coworkers at last place, um, you know, think of the owner, think of the, the snowboarder, yeah. you know, think of different people. Uh, and just think about like how different those people's paths were. How do they get to be such a badass? So different. So, um, yeah, I, you know, 
I don't know. So what like, kind saying, of like, bringing this full circle, though. But like, correct what's me the, if I'm wrong. Like, just to bring this to the thing, like John, from what the way I understand, John Carmack is essentially self-taught. Like he did yeah, not. As far as I know, you know what I mean. And like he would be arguably one of the greatest software developers alive right? You know, yeah, exactly. depending on and what field you're talking in, but like, that's why I said like Carmack and Norvik, right? So Car but no Carmack Norvik has a super academic background. That's what I'm right? saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Right. So Carmack is like a, a deadbeat, nearly in juvenile hall for, you know, like whatever the hell it is. Right. And like, you know, nearly. Almost you know, nearly, a non-functioning member of society. Almost a non-functioning member of society. And then by some weird ass. Right? And he's like hit the people he colluded with were on that track as well. Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. Like was yeah, that John people... Romero wasn't really much better, but somehow they like. And to be clear, when you're saying colluded, he means you know you mean colluded for success, not like some kind of nefarious collusion, right? No, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So you got that whole end there. And when we say self-taught in his case, there's a lot of textbook reading and stuff, right? He he collaborates with some. There's a lot of ownership. Exactly. And I think, but I bet, and I bet then you the other through... here, you've got Norvig, another person who I respect on, you know, in another similar, like, wow, like, like not just respect, like that's. And would you right? say Norvig's book on AI is the definitive textbook on AI? Maybe not the definitive book, but no, I know many universities my, use it. My understanding was there was a period in history, maybe not so much anymore, but there was a period in history where uh, Norvig's book on AI was, was one of two, the books. Yeah. Is, if I understand correctly, that's just, I, 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 I don't really have enough personal knowledge of the field to say that with confidence, but that's what I have been, that's what I've been told is yeah. that there's a period in history when Norvig's book is one of two, the books. He's an extremely successful software develop, uh, you know, software uh, engineering manager at Google. He's done a ton of awesome stuff. And, so and, and it's not just the big scale stuff uh, every year. So I, as you know, I compete in this advent of code thing every year. Uh, yep. Not that I'm competitive on any kind of like serious scale, but um, I like to make my friends look bad. And, uh, Every year, Norvig releases his solutions, and they just—they're just infuriating with their elegance. So let, let me tie something back. Enraging. About this. They're enraging, Aaron. <laughs> I can't go because I, to be honest with you, you've turned me off. Um, advent of code. Like, a normally I'm really busy whenever it comes out, but B, I just know that I'm not going to be in like sniffing distance of you and it pisses me off aaron if every time i knew i wasn't going to be within sniffing distance of you i gave up i would just have to go live in a fucking <laughs> shack in the woods yeah, i can't but afford that shit I... put your fucking adult pants on aaron and no but next i'm year. trying to like adult pants you bitch no because you've already like i already have evidence in our sh I, I can see your scores on tis 100 versus mine so there's already like this thing that i know about between us that's right but um but Aaron, and like Aaron, what, Aaron, I, what Aaron, i'm Aaron. trying to egotistically do here is give the illusion to the students that we both shared that's like i don't want them to know about my that my deficiencies in computer science Aaron, if every dude i fucking <laughs> tell them about my deficiencies in like you know career management project management ah. and actually making effective software I fucking come right and tell them that like, listen, yeah, I'll but give like, you back to esoteric school skills. I'll give you advice, kid. But if you really want the truth, go, go talk to that asshole with who's going to call you. My, well, like, am I my, allowed to say on YouTube, the sort of word you use in public? No, it's fine. Um, my, <laughs> my, my skills with process and that level of, you know, like software teams is less sexy than being like, I am like, cause people talk about, should I study leak code? Nobody's like, should I like, read X, Y, Z about human interactions and difficult conversations so that I can better, like nobody, like I'm that guy and nobody thinks of that as part of their software career. Bullshit. But, no, Bullshit. I'm not saying, sorry, not nobody, no students at Lighthouse are, are like, no one's going to get no. jazzed about no. that versus no, you no, who's wrong. like- That's wrong, that's wrong. There's a certain personality that's more verbal. Okay, more I think what you do is cooler and I'm having a hard time with it. I see, well- <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I want to tie this back, right? So back to well, your hyperfluence. No, and I think as we both and yeah. the as we both know and the viewers of this video should know, the correct thing to do yeah. when someone says what you just said <laughs> is to fucking put the adult pants on and show up for the competition and every year close the gap. Just FYI. Just right. want to remind you of that. You just gave me all this bargaining leverage, man. Ugh. Next year, November 28th or whatever, I'm just going to look this video up and just send it to you every six hours until you- uh, What have I, what what have have I done? done?
That's we can right. do this, Aaron. We can do this. Uh, <laughs> we should do it as like a, like a Twitch stream. Yeah. Um, yeah um, uh, so anyway, I want to like what you said about Peter Norvig, I think actually ties back to this hyperfluency versus fluency of esoteric. So there's this, you know, famous in particular circles, Amazon review that Peter Norvig left on structured interpretation of computer programs. Really? SCIP. That where like have you not are you not familiar with this? No. So the 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 short version is like while you you know excitedly Google it, um, is he's basically saying that like there's this like SCIP on Amazon.com, the American site, I believe has almost like a 50-50 rating between people going like this is like a masterpiece of like software development like every software developer needs like this is you know right in that esoteric thing and 50% going this is impractical I don't need this nothing I do every day as a Rails developer um, matters in this book right and um, he kind of has a thing of saying like you are he's on the thing of like this is not esoteric he's more on the side of like you don't know what you're missing by not acquiring this. And like, you know, I guess one of the big parts of that book for anyone who hasn't heard of or approached it is that, you know, it makes, it leans pretty heavily on Lisp. And, um, and some of the paradigms that that language steers you towards, right? Because I feel like, you know, I'm not very versed in Lisp by no means, but uh, from what I, the small amount of Lisp I've done is most popular paradigms can be applied to it. Right, mostly you know whether it's procedural, functional, object oriented, you can kind of implement it however you you want. And there's something to be said about that. And it, and I never got to there. There's this this claimed experience that you have with Lisp, like it's some kind of spiritual path where you have an awakening, and then you know you see the matrix code, and then everything is changed about your wiring of the brain. And you know I'm excited about that idea. I've just never been able to commit to it long enough to go through that experience. I don't know anyone firsthand who can, can vouch for it, but he has this interesting thing, and I think you know it really sums up that idea of like is this is learning Lisp and going to learn SCIP and all of this stuff an esoteric you know thing, or is there like is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's right. Yeah, so I feel like that, that, I think in our ideal taxonomy of knowledge, right, there's a different kind of esoteric there from the one that I was thinking of. But the problem is that I think you can't tell them apart from the outside. You can only tell if the juice is worth the squeeze after you drink it. Yeah, so this brings up like almost like a third problem. Yeah, and it's a rough one. It's a rough one. So to, just, to, just to make sure I'm clear there on what I just said, right? Um, for example, I, so I, I think Red Black Tree is a really entertaining example simply because like they're so freaking technical. Like it's like the thing that's difficult about them. I'm not saying they're like incredibly difficult. I'm saying that what it is that's difficult about them is so fiddly and, and micro attention-y. And it's, it's mandatory material in a second year class in most computing science curriculums. Uh, so most sort of A students at some point got it and then probably forgot it. And then a lot of sort of B students that sort of got it definitely forgot it. And they feel stupid for having forgotten it maybe. But I think that's feeling stupid for having forgotten. It's a waste of time because the actual profit from knowing how to do you know, red black tree rotations is super, super narrow super narrow right so this this knowledge is esoteric knowledge in this kind of like you know if you enjoy the act of twisting your brain through those knots to get it then you're gonna have a good time this also, is kind of the thing that also puts me off advent of code is it's like i never spend enough time on algorithms to feel second nature with like the main ones i feel comfortable with like if you want me to do the, the common yeah, but, 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 things, but, but, okay fine you're gonna distract me that code thing dude i don't think i used a single difficult technique i just used you know like like by the standard i'm talking about here yeah right i don't think i used anything half as difficult as red black trees all fucking year this year last year was a little rougher 
So what's a technology that would make use of a red black tree? Like, you know, that's a common one. Like, is this like saying that's popular in like database engines or something like that? Like what's, what's its, what, what, what problem does it solve for? Like, there's a lot of algorithms that solve many real world problems. Like, is that far? Like, what is it? Is it like, what, okay, what, so, what, what so, is it analogous okay, to? Okay, a little, little algorithm class just for a second here, right? Yeah. I, I don't know how to answer the question at quite the spirit you want. And, it, you know, you want something reasonable, but I don't know how to give you what you want. So yeah. I'll give you something a little less useful. Uh, Self-balancing binary trees give you a data structure. Let's see if I can get this right. I'm, this is going to go on YouTube, and then people are going to criticize me in the comments because I didn't get it right from memory, friggity frig, where it's got, like, uh, you know, you want insertions to be done in order log n of the size of the tree, you want lookups to be done in order log n of the size of the tree, you want deletions to be done in order log n of the size of the tree, something like that. I probably got one of those wrong and it's embarrassing. Anyway, um, and you know, it, uh, I think, a, so first of all, a lot of the time, you know, you study all those things and then you notice that hash tables solve all those problems better. Well, not all of them, because if you want to extract a subsequence, hash tables are useless. And if you want to extract a subsequence, those self-balancing binary trees, you can do these like little uh, like edge walks, um, you know, like walks along the leaves that kind of like pull out like all the things. Um, anyway, the um, you know, as, as we all know, a lot of databases use B trees and but this, this is more this, like something like, that would speed up an interpreter or something like that, like a code interpreter that's trying to like dynamically walk an AST or something. Is that where this is? Well, it's generally used for things along the lines of what a hash table is used for mm. with this additional desirable property that you can say like, you know, don't just give me like, like, you know, if, if say I've got some hash table and, it, and it's, it's the keys are all numbers between one and a billion, right? And I, but they're not all present. Like there's only, a, there's only 10,000 things in my hash table, right? but they're all keyed by some number to one billion. So if I say, you know, is 1,106,000 in the hash table or not? Very fast answer. If it is in there, give me its value. Very fast answer. Whether it's there or not, write to it. Very fast answer. But if you say, give me everything between a million and two million, your only plan in a hash table is loop through all the possible keys and try them, right? So your binary trees give you a way to actually say like, go look up a million, go look up a billion. You did two lookups. And now just give me everything between the two lookups, however many it is. If there's only six things, you pay six prices. You know, you pay six. If there's a million things between a million and two million, well, then you pay a million. You have to pay for everything you return. But you don't pay for all the holes that you missed. Whereas in the hash table option, you pay for every time you, every, every place there could have been something. Yeah. Not just every place there was something. Anyway, 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 anyway. Where was I fucking going with this? Damn Probably, <laughs> anyway, you were talking oh, about esoterica, like... esoterica, esoterica, yes. right? So like, this is a super narrow, this is challenging. A lot of people learn it in second year and then forget it. That's all cool, whatever. If, if you want to know how, you know, if you decide for some reason you want to learn this thing, it's a well-defined little area of what you're going to learn, right? It's very easy to say, you know, can you implement a red black tree or can you not? Can you implement a, what's the other, uh, you know, whatever, anyway, right? Can you do this or can you not? And you can like establish to yourself, it's, it's nice and tidy, it's nice and discreet. But the thing is, it's almost useless. I don't mean it's actually useless, no hate, but like, you know what I mean? But then you're like, um, you know, uh, can you write a, like a- um, Like when you say it's useless, the utility of say mastering red black tree to say versus mastering the A star algorithm, one exactly. is gonna have a lot more utility in your career. Exactly, or like learning to write a parser. Yeah. Right, and the parser is like, maybe a little more esoteric in some sense, in the sense that it's like the path you have to walk to get good at it is murkier. You know what I mean? Yep. How will I get there? How will I become the sort of person who can write a parser on demand? But it's less, you know, so, so technically properly esoteric means hidden knowledge, right? Secret knowledge. So on the, you know, if, if you actually mean that by esoteric, if you mean like sec secret hidden knowledge, which isn't really what I meant originally. I, I used it badly originally. But if what you mean is secret hidden knowledge, then the parser, while not really secret, it's more secret than the red black tree. The red black tree is a very well-defined little thing. You know, you go find the six pages in the textbook. You just read them over and over and over again until you get it. Now you get it. Maybe it takes you two hours. Maybe it takes you two years. I don't know, right? But it's like it's well-defined. The parser thing is more vague. Or like, I see a lot of problems where I like, I feel guilty that I never, or like-, like When, when guilty, you say foolish. the parser is more vague because of the number of things you could potentially be parsing in their use case, no, because of the like, 
the like number of, instead of it being like, to do this, learn this narrow skill. And then that is like to do this, you know, like, like the breakdown of the sub skills in learning how to do red black trees is very articulate. It's just like, learn this, learn this, learn this, learn this, learn this, learn this. Yeah. The parser stuff is more like, kind of like, well, you know, there's a couple different alternatives, figure one out, maybe figure a few out. Uh, and you're talking about like, just in the terms of like how there's like grammars in interpreters yeah, and organization like and related stuff. And you don't really like need to like master any of it, but you need to get good enough at a bunch of it to be able to go on to the next yeah. step. And it's, and it's, it's, it's like, I forget what the name's doing. Like depending on what direction you move through the syntax tree, this is the, what's the names for the two different approaches. There's all this stuff about as like, like there's, what is it? There's like, I think there's like five standard parts to a compiler and as you like the parts of the tokenization and all this kind yeah, of stuff, exactly. right? All and that's, stuff and that's just like, you know, I guess passing is just one piece of that, but kind of more than that as well. That's right. Exactly. So were you to master the red black tree just for the laughs and remember it for your whole career, the odds you would ever use that knowledge profitably are, I think like ever, even once are pretty low. Yeah. But if you master writing parsers, I'm not saying this is the best return on investment. I'm not saying you def, I don't know. I, I, I think it's a, I think it's maybe a good use of time, but probably there's better. But if you do master the parser, I think a lot of people have reported the same experience that like from the time I learned how to write parsers until the end of my career, I found it profitable to write a parser like every two years. Yeah, it's it's really rolled dice. So let me give you maybe a real world example that I'm I'm aware of in my life where this probably mattered. So um, I, I'm like, you know, that self-taught versus years, all these different things. So like, I went the boot camp route and I went through three different boot camps. So initial a web boot camp, and this was early when boot camps were just being created, and they were kind of really a different beast then than what they are tonight today. Um, there they could be because they could be a lot pickier because that they they weren't competing with so many other schools. So like the the outcomes were like wildly different to what they were able. Like the, the marketing material definitely that initial hype train came from genuine results that the early boot camps got. But like many things, a lot of the results that great schools get is through their filtration process, not necessarily their their system. Not to say plus, that that's not an plus impact. There as was well. some weird stuff in the software hiring market at the time that also made it easier to boot. Yeah. You know, like on Ex top of exactly. That. I also backed that up pretty quickly by then moving from web to doing a mobile one. I wanted to understand more about it compiled, something that wasn't using like a web browser as its, as its interface and just like the architectures behind that. And then, you know, a few years later, I went on to do a computer science boot camp in San Francisco that was uh, created by one of the original senior teachers of the first boot camp I went to that I really sort of built like connected with and, and enjoyed. Um, that when I went there, one of the students who was in my cohort at the time was gone there doing some night studies on, uh, he was in my algorithms class and my um, compilers class, right? And, and he was a really smart guy. And I'd have to fact check this, but from memory, I'm almost like, I'm, I'm like 90% sure he was a self-taught programmer. Like he didn't do any degree or anything like that. No, seriously, at best he might've done a boot camp as well, but I'm, I'm almost certain that he was a self-taught programmer. And at the time he was working at Uber. Um, and he went on to join one of their internal teams where they created a, internally created their own time series database. I don't know why they did it or what they did, but they did it. And I think it's been open sourced and published, right? So his ability to join that team and go on to create this, you know, open source database that may not be widely adopted, but from what I can tell, I believe they do use it at Uber, right? So I think that like, you know, there's, if you, there's a rare, there's a limited set of opportunities to do that. I don't think that's presented to everyone in their software career, but that, that's, self-taught self-motivated individual would never have even known that was an opportunity pursued that opportunity or all these like lists of other variables had they not studied compilers studied algorithms so like you know like kind of bringing back some of the self-taught debate and the esoteric non-esoteric is you know i think the self-taught debate thing comes a lot down to ownership but well where do you want your career to go like what kind of you know tickles you, I guess, like what gets you excited? Um, and I guess another hurdle is what gets you excited is sometimes the thing that teaches you how to do the thing that is you find exciting isn't exciting to learn as well. Yeah. That's like a whole nother hurdle. Whole other hurdle. Yeah. So yeah, to bring it back to this whole, like, um, you know, 
Norvig's review, which I sort of scanned here. Um, and there is this sort of this big question about like, how do you tell which of the like esoteric tricks are actually just cool tricks if you if you like them cool but you know whatever you know which i'm claiming red black trees is like that um yeah i had fun learning that don't get me wrong uh but and apparently forgetting it but uh but i don't think there's a lot of profit there except in the sense that doing difficult things makes you smarter but there's a lot of difficult things you could do to make you smarter so do you do you think there'd be a way that we would be able to get some kind of consensus on this because i think a lot of people could put out there like they, i think there's enough shared knowledge about what's been practically applicable and what hasn't like can you approach it from that direction or is that dangerous because you start to limit certain directions of inquiry but you know it, it's kind I of really like wonder what motivates the things people say so why are so many people doing interviews with algorithms yeah, this is a great example. Like, what is the and for companies that like may or may not make any use of that skill set? I have made almost a use that skill set in any of my jobs past the interview, where you know I I do algorithms interviews well and I get good results at that level. And nobody wants those skills mostly. Like, not literally nobody, but oh, it's so vanishing. It's so rare that people want those skills on the job. Uh, they're using it as a test in place of something else they want, right? You mean like, it's kind of like a, a measure of someone's problem solving capabilities, but is it? Because exactly. how many of these can just be like, um, and so you talk to a lot of devs and internalized. You talk to a lot of devs who've been to university and you say, you know, what do you think is the applicability of, you know, whatever, uh, you know, how important do you think it is to know about big O notation and you know, the great majority of them are like, yeah, really important, really important. Oh yeah. And like, so when is it, if, when has it actually allowed you to make a decision differently that you would have, you know what I mean? Like when has it actually come? And I don't know, maybe I'm just like not, maybe my biases are overriding this, but I really feel like people sort of like insist this stuff is valuable because they had to go through it. So everybody else has to go through it too. I don't know. Maybe that's just like the- They kind of value their rite of passage. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe like, I'm just being unfair, but I I really wonder. Now, now, I tried this line on a, I, I have a close friend. Uh, I've been talking with him a lot this year. Uh, he's had a very successful career. Uh, he's worked on projects that everybody listening to this video knows about the existence of. He's, you know, he's, he's competent. He's a competent guy. And uh, like me, he graduated, you know, graduated from high school with me in the 90s and he uh, promptly did his university study uh, at the same school I went to and then, uh, um, you know, went and got a legitimate career right away, unlike me screwing around for a decade first. Um, and I was, I, I was giving him this sort of like, but admit it, you didn't use a single class from school, right? Like, I mean, maybe not a, maybe not, not a single class, but like pretty close, right? And he's like, what? So like he has managed to have a career where he used, you know, more than 50% of the classes from more or less the same degree I took. And I've somehow just like failed to figure that out. Yeah. So I think this sort is, of what right? is, is like, we don't have a clear shared knowledge of where particular skills apply. So it's yeah. like, I guess it's, if you think about it, it's like the software development industry is crazy diverse in the yes problem. yes and I, I like one of the ones that come up in you know a previous discussion i had recently is it's the one job skill you can have where you can literally work in several completely different industries your whole like throughout your career it's like as a coder you might work in the music industry you might work in farming and what i mean is like you're producing software around this and you have to develop some domain knowledge in these industries so all of a sudden if you've got a particular interest in an industry you can have this or, or several industries it's this like skill that can kind of get your foot in the door in multiple sectors of society right so it's, it's you know it's it's very 
spread out like there's what there's very diverse very diverse right maybe something like uh writing might be as similar skill where you know you can write about many subjects and maybe. stuff right so there's, there's only a handful of these kinds of fields where the skill itself can be applied to many human pursuits right or or interact or maybe not apply but interact well with i think when you say interact with I actually disagree there's a lot of careers that are very supportive like that yep you know just as an example, you know, like examples, uh, accounting, law, yeah, management, HR, advertising, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you can do. Sales, obviously, there's a lot yeah. of things you can do that apply to almost every industry. But so I think that's sort of putting the spin on it that I think is well, like true, not as special as you're making it out to be. But if you just, what I think is sort of striking is that like, Nobody thinks that truck drivers and pilots are the same career. Yeah, or maybe even like a sea captain. Or a sea, exactly. Yeah. Or bicycle racers. Or you know what I mean? Like 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 nobody thinks that that uh, you know nav like like steer a conveyance is like one career. That's yeah. a, that's twenty careers or more, right? Nobody thinks that um, uh, use hand tools to build things. <laughs> is one career, right? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like carpenters, welders. Yeah, so this welders. is, you're, you're making my point, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I, exactly. so I think the thing you said, yeah, yeah, right. I think I think the first half of what you said was exactly right. And then I think you went off the rails. So I'm just discriminating between the part that I wanted yeah. to knock down yeah. and the part that I'm like, you're exactly, 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 exactly right. Exactly, so, right. The, the range of types of software development, they're all just from the outside thought of as software development. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's like saying, like said, the hand tools. It's like, if you know hand tools, you're in construction. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's that's like a, a gross overgeneralization. Yeah. And I think as an industry... And, and see what the like lead electrician thinks when the apprentice welder shows up and expects a job. Exactly. Like, right? see how that fucking goes down. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, and like, to, to, you know, to give credit to some of these industries, some of them are thousands of years old, right? Absolutely. So, it's a factor. So, that they've had time to draw logical boundaries and evolve that over time. Yep. But this software industry has, you know, for the most part, borrowed from other industries that seemed similar at the outset and, you know, you know, the, you know, and, and try to incorporate their systems and their processes and their managements and hiring practices and stuff. And there's just a lot of making it up. And a lot of companies that hire software developers like are have existed for like a very short period of time. And what I mean short is a lot of students go to work for a company that may not have existed for a year. Like, yes. I don't know what the numbers are. You can probably find it out, but let's, I, I'll tell you numbers that wouldn't shock me. If you said that, uh, sixty percent of graduates go to get jobs at companies that have been around for less than twelve months. I would be like me, like I wouldn't be like that's a crazy number. Even, I, I would even if you push that up to like seventy percent, I'd be saying yeah, like you know, it would take a long time for me to be like yeah, like you know yeah, to be like wait, fact check that you can't be right. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I so agree. It's like and relatedly, I, I hear these numbers about just it's a little bit unrelated, but it's a you know about the number of total devs in the market and how yep. fast that curve is growing, right? You know, the doubling time is every, you know, I've heard different stories, but I, I, I one story I heard, I don't know if it's correct, is that the doubling, you know, that, that every two years, there's twice as many devs in the industry as, as two years ago, right? And it's just like, so I don't know if that's correct or not, but like, it certainly explains some things you see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I guess- um, Including, I guess by the way, why boot camps are economically a possibility. Absolutely, absolutely. Just because that 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 supply and demand and 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 things like that. Um, but yeah, I think that like there there hasn't been a concerted effort to be public about like what actual skills people use in their particular roles. And if you're not knowing the skills, it's very hard to map a path for some of these things. It's like you know, so far I've done been doing several interviews with uh, bootcamp graduates who have been you know, out in the industry for like we say talking here, three, four, five years. Yep. And all of their pathways are very different. All of their goals and objectives were very different. And, um, you know, it's very difficult, you know, and then having so many conversations with students about to graduate about what their career is, everything from like, look, I just need a job, any job to like, I want to work like on this project at this company. Like I'm definitely going to a Fang or I want to work at game studio or something like that. Um, 
And it's kind of crazy because I think the underlying trend is, is like, forget about that part. It's like, it's all comes back to this idea of ownership. And I mean, ownership over your, um, your development and, and your, and your trajectory within this, your ocean analogy, within these storms and these winds of like, there's only so many companies hiring at the month that you're looking for jobs. Yep. And there's only, you know, you can afford certain kind of like, there's all these things, but you still have to grab that tiller and grab those ropes and start pulling on them. So like, I'm normally a little uh, concerned when people are like, I just want a job, any job. I'm like, I, I think this can work out for you and you can discover it as you go. I think it's a little too extreme. Um, and then on the other end, I uh, feel more comfortable when people have a clearer idea of their outcome. Um, but then uh, I'm very careful to understand, it's like, see what you want to do. There's a, a good chunk of work and input there. I don't want to burst your bubble. I don't know whether I have to be brutally honest about what's going to be involved there. Uh, so that you 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 can commit, or maybe you know, do, do I, I like? I'm very scared of encouraging someone to find something that's a better fit. I, I I'm really against that idea across the board. But I definitely mm. would like you know, who do you know who's walked a path? Like, is there something about when you walk a path about like the blindness of not knowing where you're going that actually gets you through? Versus if you knew all the trials and tribulations, would that prevent it? Mm. Certainly, I don't know if that's true in normal people lives. I think if you look at how people get to be super rich, a lot of I think the time, people that are most people that are entrepreneurial, I think tend to be optimistic and then are resilient to back that up. Yep. They're like and a lot of and a lot of them just die. So there's all this survivor bias, right? They're too optimistic and so they just die. And I don't necessarily mean literally die. I mean get themselves in such a bad place that we never hear from them ever again. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so it is a bit tricky to figure out what the survivor bias is there, but I, yeah, I think that, um, if you're crazy enough to say, I'd rather be dead than poor or something like that, you know, I'd rather not even poor, like I'd rather be dead than not rich. You know, some people are just like, like super rich or nothing. Get right? rich or die trying. Get rich or die trying. <laughs> exactly. Right. And if you're serious about that enough, to mean it, which I think is a sign of serious problems. And I think you should reconsider, but um, then in that case, I, I feel pretty confident actually that ignorance helps you get rich or die. But I don't know if it's as true for people who are trying to kind of just live awesome lives instead of live like the life most awesome possible or die. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's kind of it. So just summarize, we're coming to the end here. We've sort of been going on for a while, but there's some interesting things that kind of gone here. There's the optimi uh, optimism inspired by ignorance is of value, but being honest with yourself and taking ownership of your gaps is also of value. And then there's, it sounds like there's a third thing here that, you know, is uh, putting yourself in environments that are supportive but you also need to be able to cultivate some resiliency. For sure. I think all those things are true. I think what I was saying about the optimism and ignorance thing is that I, I do think there's circumstances where the ignorance is valuable, but I'm not sure there's any. You know what it is? I think ignorance in terms of what's possible is valuable, but ignorance in terms of um, what you understand is maybe not possible. Cert that, certainly there's a, a differentiation there. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, even ignorance in terms of what's possible, I think there are circumstances where that is valuable, but I'm a little skeptical whether there's whether you want to be chasing that rabbit. I feel like it only might be valuable once you've already sort of committed to things you shouldn't have committed to in the first place. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, 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 th I, I on the one hand, you know, I think you live a good life, a good life by striving. So I don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't want to like oversell the next thing I want to say, but I also think that people who think that like, you know, this is just going to sound so, so like trite and oversaid, but like, if you think you've got to get there to be happy, then you won't be happy when you get there. So 
you know, sort of being like, that's got to be my destination. I've just got to do what it takes to get to that destination. Maybe just like, think about it for a second. Like you live in a, like, if you're rich enough to see this video, then you're rich. Like most humans through history have been in danger of starvation their whole lives. Right. Like there's been whatever, like a hundred billion humans ever or something like that. Yeah. And you know, 90 billion of them or whatever spent their whole lives about to starve to death and then didn't or did, you know, a lot of them did. And like, if you have, you know, I have never a day in my life wondered if I was going to starve to death. And there's probably a small number of people watching who are like, well, lucky for you, asshole. But almost everybody watching is in the same situation. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like, you're already doing so fucking well. That doesn't mean stop striving and start, but like, but like a little bit of like, if you are like, I've got to be over there, here's not good enough. I've got to be over there. Grass is greener. Grass um, is greener. So you're, you're still going to be so unhappy. Do, you, do you think that the uh, esoteric is a case of grass is greener? Like that's what I'm saying. This is what we're boiling down. Is esoteric a case of grass? Like pursuing fluency in the esoteric, is that a grass is greener? And should you be just sticking to your lane and being hyper fluent in the, in the fundamentals? Um, I'm not saying stick to your lane. Yeah. Definitely not. So is there a way to know when to change lanes? But there's a lane? difference between like, it's one thing to be like curiously looking at another, I don't know how to make this like stick to your lane metaphor, uh, like fit with what I'm saying. I was going to try and then I just realized it was going to be, yeah, it's going to be a car wreck. There's the end of the lane metaphor. Anyway. Um, it's one thing to like, look around and be curious, but it's another thing to be like, Oh, I bet what I need is that like, is that like trick that glam trick somebody else has got. Yeah. It's that idea of, um, it's, I think it's a Warren Buffett thing, circle of competence. Right. And, and then he, and I believe. I don't, is this connected to like, I don't invest in tech, not because I think it's a bad idea, but because I'm not competent to do it. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that like makes, so, so the, but then there's like, can you expand your circle of competence? Yeah, 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 like, yeah, exactly. You obviously can. Right. And you should explore outside. And I, I'm thinking of like, you know, students, we but, there's, but there's, a, there's a law of diminishing turns. And like, I think the, the exploration period I'm, comes out of where you are in life. Like if you're young, explore the, the shit out of it. But as you're getting older, and this is the trend for, I think for most people is exploration pays less and less dividends. Yeah. But I wouldn't overplay that because it's still pretty important to a life well lived. I think. Yeah, no, I don't like I, I'm, I'm all about but, it, but, but I can listen, definitely reflect I, on parts of my life where I've overexplored. I, I feel like my, the, you know, I feel like the overall shape of what I'm saying is at least as reflected back by you. I don't know if this is what like everybody yeah. would get out of it, but at least reflected by you makes me sound too negative about exploration. And I'm, 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 I favor exploration. What I'm negative about is people who think that collecting shinies is maybe what they lack right now. Yes. And, and yeah, so a good example of and, that and would once be in like, a while, it's true. Like once in a while, it's true. You're missing that shiny. Stop being a dumbass. Go get the shiny. So I think a, a modern way that not true. manifests is what would be, you know, commonly referred to as JavaScript fatigue. A, a great example. The thing that, I, I the think thing that's that, what the you're thing that leads to JavaScript fatigue is totally an example of what I'm describing for sure. Because I, I can't think of an ecosystem that releases hot new frameworks as as at a as at a, at a speed that JavaScript does. As a, maybe there are. Maybe I'm just not involved in enough other ecosystems. Maybe it's because I'm more heavily influenced by the world of web development. But like, it appears to me as an outside observer that the speed at which you know there's another build tool, there's another task runner, there's another testing framework, there's another front end framework, there's another utility library, another there's another CSS a, plus JavaScript button clicky framework. Like it's like, and like to speak to that, and where I think this is is like they're like they're like lottery tickets. Careers are built off the back of this. You know what I mean? Like you nail that like next hot framework. You could be getting paid by a fan company to work on open source, like a good sweet salary. I think there's a bit of a gold rush aspect to it. Occasionally. Is it that occasional? I think there's like a pretty good amount of cases where you can, the level of quote unquote developer celebrity you get from being like, um, like one thing I mean, it's like for a popular one I know is like, was like Dan Amarov, which is Redux, right? You know, and he went on to work at Facebook. And from everything I've seen given talks, he seems like a pretty damn proficient developer. But the, like 
zeitgeist that- around him seems to describe him as like i wouldn't put him in the tier of all those other developers that we describe but i don't think he's a carmac i don't think he's a norvig i don't but i've definitely heard we don't know enough about him to be confident yeah, i want to be very clear here that i don't know like those people i have an insight through their talks and books and things written about them but i and agree this- there's no evidence that abramov and carmack are on the same level there's, yeah right and they, not- may, and they may be yeah i want to be very they might clear be we that. wouldn't you know yeah, yeah. abramov's still young maybe he's going to turn to you know but but, but I feel like there is a like he get this and, he, and the to be level clear of shiny in case anybody's, in, to be clear in case anybody's not understanding. I'm definitely putting out above substantially above myself. Yeah, yeah, me, yeah, yeah, not yeah, about yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not about like Let's, that guy's yeah, an yeah. idiot. Like, it's, yeah, yeah, you know. no, 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 no. This is yeah. But like, I think there's like, I, and I, I, I apologize to Dan if he ever says, but yeah. um, I think there's a level of glitter that comes off what he does that seems to make him appear to be at this tier, like shiny new thing. There's some like it's like. A lot of people use Redux and Facebook and React and are in that and ecosystem. Abramov writes and great, relevant, helpful material and puts it out there. Yeah. Where, and you so know, he, this is some hyperfluency. I think less people um, write Raycasters and, and, and 3D engine features and things that Carmack would be famous for, I think is much less... Um, a pro, like there's a smaller community of people that uh, operate in that space. And so, you know, this is not a value judgment, a higher law, but I mean, it kind of ties into our, like, there's such a wide field that hasn't been clearly defined. But I think that, you know, um, I think Dan's a, a, a great example of like fluency and a lot of highly valuable to the industry skills. And I think Carmax stuff for many people is more esoteric although he's executed in a way that's had crazy real world impact like game the injury i'm not saying like they both had crazy real world impact but i think that the amount of people that could take the skills that can't, like head in that direction learn c learn 3d like all that stuff that are going to be able to do what carmack did versus go in the direction of dan amarov i think you can have more dan's uh, in terms of the work he's produced than you can have carmack's yeah, I think that's true. They're probably not by as the games industry is big. It's sure. not as, it's not as big as web dev, but it's big. Like yeah, so it, it's uh, probably yeah. less true. It's pro- you know like I as I'm just as I'm just listening to you talk and it, it like the thing you're saying meets my bias, but you know because it does so I'm like applying the like but really but really but really thing in my own brain. Yep. And as I'm doing it, I'm like, I don't know. There's a lot of game devs out there. Yeah, for sure. But but how many game devs um I mean, like, work on of, the engines and all that? A, or like it game devs right. a whole different beast to what, even what if we just limit, did. Even if we just limit to engine devs. Yeah. There's still a lot of engine devs out there. Yeah, and I think that's amazing. And I think people should know how to pursue that that career yeah. path. Yeah. Um I like yeah, I think it's awesome. Like, but I, I'm just kind of saying towards like I think depending on what field you're going to, um, and yeah, maybe for those guys' perspective, going down the route of front end frameworks is esoteric knowledge. It means nothing to him. But anyway, that's kind of not really a useful thing to look at, but just in terms of like, even that scale of uh, fundamentals, the hyperfluency is going to be dictated by the context in which it's applied. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. No doubt about that, yeah. I don't anyway. know, I guess, I, I, yeah, I guess just the sort of like, uh, It's, it's definitely not that I think you shouldn't pursue the esoteric. It's just that if you're still struggling to walk, you know, trying to figure out what scuba flippers are for may or may not be the, the best, uh, yeah. the best use of your time right now. I don't know. Well, maybe I think we've kind of got to wrap it up here, but maybe we will leave the discussion of what does it mean to walk to another video? Cause I think that's int- like, what does it mean? I think there's some interesting flesh out cause we kind of covered some ground here around like what, <laughs> what are the places you could walk and like, how well can you walk that terrain versus, but like there's, you know, in real world practicality is it's like, what does walking even mean? But let's save that for a, another rant. Anyway, um, Sounds thank good. you very much for your time today. It's yeah, it was a good time. Great as usual. And um, I look forward to probably doing this again in, in the in the future. You have to get a couple more sane people on first for a little while, right? To just like bring it back to, uh, you know, bring, <laughs> bring it back to where you haven't lost the entire audience. I think that's the, the real... Oh, uh, like, I like, I think this is, I think there's a, a good number of people that enjoy the intellectual masturbation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's anyway, good mate, for a laugh. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.